Okay, I think we must get started. We're already running a little bit late. Um, again, I'm going to. I'm afraid I'm going to delay things to, for just a couple of minutes while Meryl Jeter of the Museum of London, or possibly the London Museum, um, talks uh, says something about some of the work that you will be interested in uh, preparing panoramas for the new museum display. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you, Vanessa, for allowing me to steal a bit of your time. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm working on uh, one of the galleries that's going to be in the new London Museum, opening the end of 2026. And we are working with MOLA at the moment. MOLA are producing an up-to-date reconstruction of Roman London. And we have a draft um, that's been printed out at the scale it's going to be at in the new museum. And we're very interested in people's comments because we know there's a lot of expertise in this room. So if people would like to, the map is on display um, in the next door room, in the Quayside room, and there are post-it notes there and pens. So if you spot anything that you want to comment on, please write it down on a post-it note and stick it on to the new panorama and let us know what you think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariel. Uh, now, this afternoon is, for many of us, a trip down memory lane. It's looking at the DUA and the DGLA 50 and 40 years on. And although I'm not an archaeologist, I was privileged to be working at the museum uh, at the time that DUA and DGLA were, were in their early stages and flourishing. Um, so it's great to catch up with plenty of people who will be names that will be known to all of you. Uh, this afternoon, before tea, we have John Schofield, Dom, Dominic Perring and Robert Cowie speaking about um, major sites, uh, Mudbricks and Marxism uh, and Lundenwick. Uh, we'll start straight away with John, Car John Schofield, who has already been introduced to you, so I don't need to say any more. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. In... In 2001, there was published a collection in honor of Derek Rowe, the Paleolithic prehistorian, memorably titled A Very Remote Period Indeed. The beginnings of archaeology in the city in 1974 now increasingly seem remote. Um, this is not, in half an hour, a survey of major sites in the decade after 1974, but a rather personal account of some of the sites and the developments in, uh, in place, uh, uh, to place in context the papers which follow. Um, this aerial view from the groundbreaking survey Future of London's Past in 1972 shows the city then, uh, no gherkin, very few tall buildings, quite a few bomb sites left open. And um, how many sites have been excavated since 1974? When I asked uh, at the, in January, 2024, um, the uh, collections manager said they had records of 1,337 sites in the city from 1974 until the end of 2023, which certainly puts me in my place. I identified and organised about 90 excavations in the years 1978 to 83. The situation when we started um, was one of com almost complete ignorance. Um, there was little thought of conservation-led generation. Developers and archaeologists regarded each other with wariness, if not hostility. And as archaeologists, we had no computers, no pottery type series, and no mobile phones. We were starting from virtually nothing. And we were very young. I want to tell you simply about some of the ideas that we had and which we, which we pursued. This is um, one of the other maps in the future of London's past showing the threat, as then deemed, to the, uh, to the, uh, the sites. So we set about our work. And I want to just show you a few sites which are interesting to me, uh, roughly in chronological order. Um, at New Fresh Wharf, we found the early third century quay at New Fresh Wharf and St Magnus House. These are impressive structures. Um, uh, very well built, uh, very solid, and uh, ripe for dendrochronology, as we'll see in a second. But uh, um, uh, these are the early third century wharves, impressive in their technology. Our first innovation, uh, or taking over, it wasn't our idea, but we uh, enthusiastically took up the, the uh, 
the nascent science of dendrochronology, which was non-existent in the city then, um, and uh, um, took samples principally in the first instance from the Roman structures of the waterfront and later the medieval ones, as no doubt Gustav will say. Um, so here is how you put together uh, dating from uh, dendro. Those are the, uh, the, the outer bark section of the, uh, fortunately, some of the trees for the Roman waterfront. And the other highlight of these Roman excavations was the large amount of Roman Samian pottery from various sites in France, which had been thrown in around the wharf. And more recently, uh, at least one ship, if not more than one ship, um, with uh, these wares on it, has been um, uh, found in the Thames estuary. We realised, it sounds obvious looking back now, but it was a realisation that the archaeology of London had at least four main periods, as illustrated by the west end of the St Magnus Trench, with the Roman waterfront down here, then the Saxon embankment on top of it, then on top of that, two periods of medieval land reclamation. You're looking north here to Thames Street, just next to St Magnus Church. And this realisation that we really had an equal duty to all four of the main periods dawned on some of us quickly and on others it took a long time. I was told on one of oh, this site to uh, machine down to the Roman, get rid of this medieval stuff. The um, Saxons on this site, <clears throat> as an illustration, uh, produced a grid of posts of impressive height um, around the Roman quayside, you see here, using it as a base. Um, and from this, uh, David Bentley, the, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Martin Bentley, the brother of David Bentley, um, made a reconstruction of the jetty poking out through the Roman riverside wall in the 10th century, which uh, has been hailed as something of European significance, whether it really is the first jetty to be reckoned with in post-Roman times, I'm not quite sure, but it's certainly been um, um, thought significant. For the Saxon period, we also, on several sites uh, all over the city, um, excavated buildings, um, dominantly at Watling Court, and here's uh, one of Gustav's excavations at, um, uh, near Pudding Lane. And slowly we realised that we could, we could actually plot the plan forms of large and small 10th and 11th century buildings, which wasn't really done before. And as an adjunct to that, we were able at Peninsula House to draw a section across the lower part of Botolf Lane, which you see here. There's the modern lane. And here is the 10th century street, squeezed between a sewer and something else, um, which, as far as I know, is the only example of a 10th century street uh, yet, uh, still to be or yet excavated in the city. It's very difficult to get below the streets because they're being used. Generally, medieval remains have always been fragmentary, um, but on some sites in the 10th and 11th century, near Cheapside, fortunately, uh, we were able to excavate a whole series, a series of about 100, 120 pits of 10th to 12th century date at Milk Street in 1977. Um, and uh, uh, these are an early case where we, we catalogued all the finds from a series of pits. In them were one or two spectacular objects, including this, this axe, which promptly went into the museum and uh, has been in a display ever since. So very occasionally we were able to dig up objects which uh, were taken for the museum.
Because of the um, interruptions or disturbances by Victorian buildings, the remains of medieval buildings in the central part are very scarce. But in 1977 also, uh, on Milk Street, we found the uh, parts of uh, a 12th century house, the streets up here, it is <coughs> punctuated by um, the 19th century foundations, or a small pizza cafe, I think. Um, and here, <laughs> being 1977, um, you can see the fashions of the time. I think we all wore flares then. Um, and on a nearby site in Foster Lane in 1982, um, Ian Blair found some pieces of Venetian glass, which were uh, totally unprecedented, not known about before, not found before in Foster Lane. And suddenly, therefore, the international dimension of medieval London, as well as of Roman London, uh, was uh, forced into our minds, that we began to think that maybe um, London had a place in Europe in the, or in the medieval period. Now, the second and third innovations I like to associate myself with because they arose from my suggestions. Many archaeologists have contributed to the development of funding of sites by developers, that is, of every site, not just occasional donations, but a duty to fund on every site. And this was unknown as an idea until 1978. Our work in the 1970s was funded very generously by the Department of Environment, the predecessor of English Heritage, but that was clearly not being enough. And I remember I was walking down Bow Lane, which you see here, in 1978, thinking about preparation for the site at Watling Court, which would be below these buildings on the left. And I realised that we would have to ask every developer for financial assistance. So I told Brian Hobley, and developer funding, in its widest sense, was born. The third innovation came in 1981, three years later. Kevin Flood isn't here, unless he's watching online. Here's a very young Kevin Flood and young Dick Malt in 1981 or two, when the DUA acquired a computer. Um, here they are at work. Again, a very strange thing to us that we had to explore. And what uh, the computer boys did with their finds colleagues, uh, particularly Alan Vince, um, was to create the file system, I'll call it that. It's the system of uh, using, using a computer and four-letter acronyms to record everything from these very rich sites, thousands and tens of thousands of artefacts and shirts. So this is what the information about a site quickly looked like. It's a catalogue of objects, which of course can be interrogated in any way you wish, and uh, um, uh, certainly speeded up the production of much more voluminous reports by our finds colleagues. The Oracle system, which it became, Oracle being the software, uh, must now be the largest forest city in the world. Now we come to 1981 to 2. Now I would love if anybody recognises this photograph and can tell me where it comes from, because I'd like to use it. It's an aerial view in 1982 of Thames Street. And can you see a big hole? This is Billingsgate in its relation to the present waterfront. Um, this is a large area south of Thames Street, uh, supervised by Steve Roscombe's in 1982, and we spent just under one million pounds in a year. This enabled uh, us to put sheet piling around the excavation because we knew it was going down deep. This is an idea I got once at the Copper, Copper Gate, excavation in York, and I came back in 1980 thinking, we can do that, which we duly did. And this is the only way to get down to, in fact, the Roman deposits at the foot of this. What you see here, 
just as they've cleaned the site below the Victorian uh, warehouse walls. We've uh, dropped in the piling, the sheet piling, and it's a whole neighbourhood of uh, medieval and Tudor buildings. Um, the waterfront, which was below that, uh, was the, uh, to some extent the star of the show. Uh, this is the waterfront of about 1,200 on the site, uh, with its uh, important details of carpentry, uh, which no doubt we'll hear about. The um, area of the site was, in fact, shown in red, but it was slightly, it was somewhat larger than that. It was a, a larger site. Um, oh, big part, that might be me. Um, that is where the site was, showing how it was near Thames Street, <coughs> and there's a whole further development of late medieval and early modern development to the south that we didn't investigate. And just note in passing the distance from there to Billingsgate Dock. This was to be the site of something I'll mention later on. This is from Ogilvy and Morgan's uh, post fire map of 1676. The, um, the excavation uncovered uh, several buildings on both sides of Bottle Wharf the lane that led to the river. And in studying them, there's an undercroft there, um, we can, excuse me, um, we can, uh, we were able to study the uses of these buildings, many of which were illuminated by documentary history, the work of Tony Dyson and others, um, and illustrated by pottery, uh, which was very abundant, and this is just one example from a drain at New Fresh Wharf, the site next door, uh, which illustrates um, several foreign types, uh, including pieces from Werra in Germany um, and Valencia. So again, the international aspect of living in London. The small finds, I will just pass over, uh, mentioning that there, were, there are thousands of objects of Roman and medieval date from these waterfront excavations. And uh, in the 1780s, they were all drawn. Uh, there wasn't much faith in photography. Um, they were drawn by a team headed by Nick Griffiths. And there are some of his superb examples of uh, medieval objects from um, um, Swan Lane and elsewhere, which were, as I'm sure some of you know, published in a series of catalogues, which are still in print. And the, um, the ones which um, feature medieval items of clothing um, are used by people who uh, um, replay the Battle of Barnet and things like that. Another new venture for the 1970s was expansion into monastic, monastic archaeology, both by the DUA and DGLA. Um, but I have to say that the topographical effects of all these monasteries, you see here, dotting and indeed clogging up the landscape, um, their, their topographical effects uh, have yet to be studied. There's a whole avenue of work to be done on... Um, the monasteries and their effects. And, of course, at the dissolution, they were suddenly turned inside out. These private estates suddenly became public. You could walk through them instead of having to walk around them. And so this kind of implosion of all these sites, 20-odd of them, was a very thrilling event in the 1530s. Um, I was concerned with one, the first to uh, be inside the city walls, apart from the cathedral, uh, Holy Trinity Priory by Aldgate. And I was able to use the abilities of a person called Richard Lee, 
who uh, could draw buildings. So as computers gradually became, came online in the 80s, um, he stopped drawing with templates and started drawing on computer. And here are two of his pictures of Holy Trinity Priory using very detailed graphic surveys that we had from around 1586 by a man called Simmons. And we, we published these eventually in 2005, but the work started really in 1979. And in them we were able to explore and even make short movies about um, the inside of the church from various sources, antiquarian sources, uh, um, some excavation and imagination. And I have to say that um, as far as I can see, uh, we've not produced anything better in the last 20 years. As computer graphics go, these are quite crude, but I haven't seen anything better done on a computer since. Post-fire London only slowly entered the archaeological consciousness. But it did. And um, I've just uh, published a report last December, 40 years after the event of our waterfront excavations in the post-fire period, up to about 1800. Post-medieval and post-fire archaeology is, is a peculiar state because the documents are far richer than before. Um, whereas the archaeology on the whole is dwindling. But we try to match all the sources. Um, here, for instance, is a, a, a painting by Canaletto showing the, the waterfront of London. Um, and it, it must have been a spectacular place of imperial nature, because after the Great Fire, London became the hub of a, a very new thing, the British Empire, which was new in the history of London, and it had to have buildings to suit. And the warehouses, and later big complexes, the East India Company, um, and the, the hold the, these warehouse buildings had on the city's topography is quite remarkable for the 18th and 19th centuries. There are also details that um, we had at the time in 1982, and I hope that others can be found, but th th this will be a rarity. Um, we did find uh, pieces of post-fire buildings, including in situ. This is a window in Bottoff Lane, sorry, in Love Lane, uh, found because the house next door was probably built up against this wall, and uh, the window may have um, uh, lit a stair, so it, it was saved by, by, by being forgotten about until 1982 when it was recovered and is now in the museum. The other aspect of post-fire London, which we have been studying recently and which I think is important, as I say it in these surroundings, is London's connection with slavery. Now, these connections are not well known, and the evidence is quite exiguous. But gradually, we are uh, worming it out. And one archaeological aspect came up in 1982. Who knows what these are? You know there's a quiz, did you? Cowrie shells. Thank you, sir. Um, these are cowrie shells, which were used by the ton in their millions they were, they were brought from the Maldives or, or, or the Indian Ocean, brought to London or Amsterdam, auctioned off to the slave merchants who took them in their ships to um, use them as currency, the currency in East Africa. And they were used to buy slaves. These are part of a, presumably a bag that broke in one of the warehouses on the Billingsgate site around 1700. When we know one of the uh, tenants was thinking of going on a trip to Guinea, which can hardly have been other than a slaving voyage. But apart from these little anecdotes and some details of the slave owners' houses, we have still a lot to do to explore the links between London and slavery. Uh, 
Um, I'd like to tell you about two regrets. One is personal, the other is departmental. Um, in the 70s and 80s, uh, in the late 70s especially, um, the DUA was housed in this building, the uh, old library at Guildhall. And coming and going, I often wondered why Basinghall Street curved like this around the building. And in my study of the medieval Tudor <coughs> city, I kept staring at this post-fire street map. Um, and there is the curve around what would be our office. And I did not notice this one. Or if I did, I paid it scant regard. Now, I know with hindsight, most of you can instantly see what that represents. If you've been to a place like Lucca and other places, you will know that an amphitheatre determines the topography of the streets around it. And if I had announced in the early 80s that I thought a Roman amphitheatre was there, six years before it was discovered in 1988, I would be, at first I would have been laughed at, and then I would have been regarded as a prophet. But sadly, I did not. Great regret. Um, and here, here is the proof. Um, there, there is the outline of the amphitheatre as found after the excavations. And there's our building down there. It's some kind of outer ring of some kind. I don't, I don't know what it was, a wall or a ditch. It's outside the amphitheatre proper, but it clearly mirrors its shape. Now, the other regret is from 1983 to 4, to close my speech. Um, here is one of Richard's drawings of the Billingsgate excavation, there's the excavation, one of the largest of its kind, but puny by comparison to the area that was going to be developed. Um, there, there's the Billingsgate market, which survives of 1870. This is what it became. Um, when we finished the excavation, there was the watching brief in circumstances in which we had no power at all. The national and the local government were completely indifferent. They shrugged their shoulders, as I'm ashamed to say did the higher echelons of the, mu of the museum. And this was the trucking away of tons of medieval deposits full of finds. Now, fortunately, Stepped into the breach, the one Jeff Egan, supremely uh, qualified for the task, who had links with metal det detector people, and he and his uh, colleagues um, worked feverishly to record what they could. And in fact, about half the, uh, the artifacts in the medieval catalogues come from the Billingsley Watching Brief. It is an enormous haul they had. And if you're wondering about where the soil went to, the um, landfill, it was all taken away by trucks into Essex, where it now sits under the shopping complex at Thurrock, which will be worth excavating one day. <laughs> uh, because, because, um, some, of the, some of the finds are, will still be there. But it is a great shame to us at the time, and I hope it never happens again. From uh, the, uh, the, um, the watching brief, there came some spectacular objects, which I'll show you a couple. There's a trumpet, the Billingsgate trumpet of about 1300, uh, studied by a musicologist. And if you go online to the Colac website, you can see a link to a young American musicologist who blows a replica. And I can tell you it's a very memorable sound he makes. Very genuine, very good. Another showing what we missed is this uh, angel corbel, uh, probably from the parish church of St. Bottle of Billingsgate, uh, found by uh, Guy de la Bedouillere, and now in his house in Lincolnshire. Um, but it shows the, the, the nature of monumental sculpture in our parish churches, including, can you see here, a merchant's, mar a merchant's mark down here. I am concluding, madam. 
Um, so here's the, here's the, um, the, the city today. The uh, eagle-eyed Romanists among you can see a an undeliberate mistake made by those who made this map. And here is my scheme of the, some of the sites and the innovations. The uh, dendrochronology, developer funding, the site manual, I didn't mention, but Dominic no doubt will, um, and um, the DOA buys a computer, and some of the major sites culminating in Billingsgate. So I think the years from 1974 to 81 were experimental as we tried our first steps, and the decade from 1981 saw the DOA in its prime. And on that note, I'll leave you in the hands of Professor Dominic Perring.